All right, hey guys. Last video we talked about child rearing, comparing it in our evolutionary past to our present, and we talked about the fact that uh, that in either case, the culture of a society shapes the way we meet a particular need, like child rearing. So what we're going to do today, or I'm sorry, in this video, is we're going to talk about our culture. We've got our same machine up here, but now I've expanded the symbolic universe and the collective consciousness so we can deal with three symbols and three beliefs that I'm going to argue are, are uh, crucial to understanding why child rearing is going to work the way it does in America. Uh, so let's begin with the symbol of the child. Now again, uh, when we talk about the symbolic universe, what we're talking about is the meaning attached to a particular thing. In this case, we're not talking about a particular child. We're talking about the category of a child, of children, and the way we define children. And I'm going to make the argument that we tend to define children as having inherent attributes. Now that isn't a complete definition, obviously, but it is an important idea of a meaning that we attach to children. The meaning of inherent attributes means that we say a kid is a good kid, a smart kid, or a bad kid. There's something inherent about it. The, the, the attributes the kid has are unchangeable. Uh, What's important for us to understand about that is that there's no research that says that. In fact, research is quite the opposite. What research says is that, uh, that children are incredibly plastic in terms of their ability to have lots of different outcomes. Even the research on giftedness suggests that, uh, or IQ, suggests that kids are not born with a particular IQ. It's not a kid is born at the IQ of 120, and that's just whatever happens, is that kid is going to be that smart. The research suggests that the way a kid is socialized, the way the kid is educated, especially in the early years, has a tremendous amount of influence. And what a kid is born with is a range of possibilities. That's probably not just true with intelligence. It's probably true in terms of their social behavior as well. Some kids are going to be more introverted. Some kids are going to be more extroverted. But the range of w at which they are able to adapt to different situations probably also depends on the exposure that they have. So this idea of plasticity or malleability is what is true about children, but I would argue it's not true about the way we conventionally think about kids. We think about them, factoring even aside the whole gender idea of girls are this way, boys are that way, we will say a boy is outgoing. Not a boy has been interacted with to maximize their outgoingness. Or a kid is shy, not a kid has been interacted with to maximize their shyness. We tend to think about kids as essential rather than plastic. And that's what I mean by this idea of having inherent attributes. Um, okay, so that's symbol number one. Uh, oh, but which I, I should say is going to play into this idea of child rearing. Later on, what we're going to talk about is the fact that if, if we define kids as having inherent attributes, it doesn't matter that much um, what kind of exposure they get in, their, in the child rearing process. They would have turned out the same way anyway. But if we define children as not having inherent attributes, but having a range of possibilities, then my God, this matters a lot. I would argue that the fact that we have the, the uh, system that is sort of haphazard and, uh, and cobbled together reflects the fact that we believe kids are going to turn out the way kids turn out. Um, they have inherent attributes, not plastic ones. All right, the second uh, symbol that we need to deal with is child care. And when I say child care, if I were to tell you, to ask you, who's going to take care of a child? For most of us, if I say, imagine a child care worker. For most of us, what we will imagine, if I were to say, think of one, just get an image in your mind, you'll think of a woman. And it's because in our society, 
we define child care as a women's issue. Uh, when we think about if, if I'm going to be asked, if my wife and I are going to be asked about who's going to be responsible for picking the kid up from daycare, the odds are most people are going to expect my wife to cut out of work early rather than me. Now this is changing in a more egalitarian way, but um, the way our child rearing is set up, uh, what, I'm sorry, the, the rules that govern our child rearing, especially within the daycare uh, environment, have been established a long time ago. These are not things that are being revisited as we become more egalitarian. Uh, so these rules were set up before, and it was based on what I would argue is still probably the majority, uh, the majority perspective, which is to assume when we think child care, we're thinking of a women's issue. Um, most men, even today, at our most egalitarian, we still only have about 25% of lawmakers that are women, which means most of the people who are who are uh, setting up the rules for child care, most of them consider it a women's issue, and most of them consider it therefore less important, less something that needs to be carefully governed by uh, by our government. Okay, um, so we've got child, we've got child care. The last one is going to be regulation in a general way. So even factoring out the fact that we define this as a women's issue, how do we as a society define government regulation? Just saying the word government regulation has a negative connotation. There's no reason for it to except for the fact that we've defined regulation as inefficient as red tape. It's important, and we saw this a little bit in the film The Corporation way back a, a few units ago. The idea that regulation is seen as creating problems, not as protecting or looking out for the welfare of all of us. We see it as a hindrance to that individual entrepreneur or the people who have created a corporation. We don't see regulation as a society. You may be different, but we're talking right now about our um, about our symbolic universe in a general way. We don't see regulation as a positive thing. We see it as, as government getting in the way. Okay, um, when we have when we have these this as the way we define reality as a society, it kind of makes sense that childcare would not be a very high priority. I mean, why would it need to be? Kids are going to turn out the way they do, and this is a women's issue. This isn't something that we as a society need to take seriously. Even today, even as we get more egalitarian, we still don't take women nearly as seriously as we take men. So if this belongs in sort of women's sphere, why would we care that much? And even if we did, what's the government going to do other than screw the whole thing up? If we define reality in these terms, it makes sense that the way this social institution is going to go is going to be to kind of allow individuals to do whatever they want. There's not a whole lot of need to, uh, to care that much about it. Okay, that's our symbolic universe. That is a small portion of how we define reality. So now let's talk about how we are supposed to live our lives. What happens within the collective consciousness? We've got three beliefs that we've got um, that we are going to talk about there. And I, I should make this clear. This is obviously not an exhaustive set of the symbols that bear on child rearing. These are just ones that I would point out as somewhat crucial to the way these practices, this, uh, this process is shaped. Okay, the uh, first belief we're going to deal with is called the ideology of individualism. And basically what it says is uh, it's an ideology in the sense that it's several beliefs wrapped up together. But basically what it boils down to is the idea that individuals are responsible for themselves. If you are successful, it's because an individual did it. If you are, if you are unsuccessful, it's because you screwed up. You are responsible for yourself. Part of that, um, 
if we think about it just slightly broader, if we apply the ideology of individualism to me, I'm supposed to be successful. Part of me being successful is being able to provide for my family. If I am, I should not need government's help to take care of my kids. I should not even need a daycare center, ideally, to take care of my kids. That's a sign of me not making enough money. Uh, so the ideology of individualism, to the extent that we believe in that, that is going to make us as a population think, well, why would, why would we need to work together to raise kids? Raising kids is on the parents. They are individuals who should be able to look after their own kids. They should be able to either do it themselves without financial help, or if they do need to, uh, by, by having a parent, and because it still is gendered, um, the woman stay home, if they can't do that, then they should be able to find affordable uh, childcare on their own. The ideology of individualism, in other words, makes it all about that individual family. That family needs to be able to be successful in child rearing on their own terms without help from others. Uh, so that is the first of our beliefs. The second belief, um, which is a, a strong belief in America, is the American family is the foundation of our greatness. Um, particularly conservatives uh, uh, go back to this idea of the American family. We've, we have to, the reason America has started to fall apart at the end of the 20th century is the decline of the family, the, the, the dissolution of the family. Now, uh, and it's not just the conservatives that believe that. I mean, liberal people do as well. Conservatives tend to look at that as the fault of the particular people in the family, divorce or women wanting to get into the workforce, whereas liberals might say, yeah, the family is foundational and therefore we need to help out the family. Um, but either way, we tend to to mythologize the American family as the source of our greatness. Now, let's think about that. If we do that, if we're saying the American family is this thing that is what makes America great, then why would we want to do anything that would threaten the integrity of the American family? We obviously wouldn't, but if we are subsidizing childcare, if we are making it more affordable for families to get childcare, what we're doing is saying, well, this family maybe isn't as important as we thought it was. We're saying that anybody can raise kids. It doesn't have to be the parent. Now, I'm not saying what we should do here at all. And I'm certainly not going to tell you what I think we should do. You should come up with your own ideas about how we can meet the need of socializing and educating our kids. All I'm saying is to the extent that we have this belief that the American family is what makes us strong, we are going to tend to not think, well, let's figure out ways of making making uh, other people take care of our children into a strong system. This is going to blind us or, or limit our willingness to really invest in a more national daycare center that some other countries have had great success with. Again, that doesn't mean that's what we should do. This is just, this is the idea that this belief is going to affect how this social institution uh, is shaped. All right, and our third one, and this won't be a huge uh, surprise uh, based on this idea of regulation earlier, it actually is a slightly different government-oriented uh, idea, but it's that government social programs are used by the undeserving. Uh, in other words, if you need government's help, you must be a freeloader, or you must have screwed up, or you must be lazy. We tend in America in the 21st century to define welfare, people who need, uh, who need government assistance, as flawed in some way. It's really important to, uh, to realize that that was not the case 
before the 1960s. Uh, the political scientist Martin Gillens has a book called Why Americans Hate Welfare. And he makes the argument that we didn't used to hate welfare, we loved it. Coming out of the Great Depression, we loved welfare because we saw the people who were going to benefit from it as mostly white people. It was in the 1960s with the civil rights legislation that said the government can't the government cannot discriminate based on race, which it absolutely did in the 1930s. Can't discriminate based on race about who is going to receive government help. That was when Americans turned, or at least white Americans, turned on government social programs and decided, well, if you need government help, you must be undeserving because all of a sudden we allowed, as a society, we allowed uh, racial minorities to take advantage of these programs that white people had been taking, and taking advantage of for years. So it, again, if you think that social programs are, are only going to be used by the undeserving, why would, if I believe that, why would I want my tax money to go to helping people find affordable ch uh, child care. Why would I want government involvement in that process? I wouldn't because I believe that anybody who is taking advantage of that is undeserving. Okay, so what we have here is, Sarah, I think that is all that I wanted to say about culture. Uh, what this all kind of wraps up into is, uh, is an individualistic culture that says American families, not somebody else, should be taking care of child care. Government definitely shouldn't be involved in that because it's inefficient and the only people who use it are the losers anyway. And this is a system that, uh, that uh, in a way, we don't really have to think that much about because kids are going to end up the way kids end up anyway. Now, what we're going to see going forward from here, this is the last that you're going to see from me in this unit, what we're going to see going forward is that this is a recipe for disaster, not a necessary disaster because other societies get child care right. They acknowledge the fact that maybe families need to be helped. Maybe being helped by the government isn't the end of the world. Um, again, there are many ways that you can do this. I'm not advocating for a particular, or telling you that you should believe in a particular form of, uh, of child rearing. Um, but other societies are going to do it much better than we do. What we have outlined here is some of the reasons for what you're going to see in the readings for a child rearing system that is somewhat disastrous, at least in international standards. Okay, that is it for me. Uh, next up, what you are going to see is a film, a documentary film called Are We Crazy About Our Kids that is really going to um, compare high quality daycare with, or high quality child rearing, child care organizations, because we'll get into the organizations now. High quality ones as compared to what is sort of the default in America. Um, sorry, it's going to be thoroughly depressing. Ask me questions about it or I will see you guys on in discussions about it. Uh, that's it for this.